That's all we got. One goddamn hit. You can't say goddamn on the air. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Cause I cannot change. I will not evolve. Welcome back to the Don't Worry, Nobody's Listening podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jason Benicki Critchlow. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and YouTube at J-A-S-O-N-B-A-N-I-C-K-I. As always, please subscribe, rate, and review to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, Google Podcast app, whenever that's coming out, uh, Podbean app, Satchel, uh, cast box wherever you get your podcast pretty much other than soundcloud and a couple other places we're there I ain't paying stitcher to put it on there either they're getting ridiculous with that too um as, as as has been the trend lately i'm joined once again by todd say hi todd hi todd no it, it doesn't work when you're 12 it doesn't work now when you're older than i am that's all we got to worry about <laughs> you keep saying that but i'm not it's factually accurate that you're older than i am Anywho, we're back for what makes, uh, you know, another week and another god-awful car foreman decision. <laughs> car packs is absolutely the unequivocally worst equipped group to run a uh, basketball franchise in the modern NBA. And if you don't follow much NBA, and I know, I know you're all sitting there, Jesus Christ, he's always talking about the Bulls. He's always talking about the Bulls. There's all these other teams to talk about. Yeah, get used to it. And until the Bulls do me the favor of firing guard packs, it's just going to be who I talk about because they're that frustrating and insane and and terrible at what they do. Like they're, they're the weathermen of the NBA. The, they're wrong so often, yet they can't get fired. I, I I don't understand it. So you know they have a guy who has never once had a positive net rating in his career. Four years in, kind of. You know, he's still got some potential to improve, but he's also kind of who he is now. Like, four years into the league, you're not a finished product, but you're a lot closer to finish than you are, you know, potential. And he's always been a net negative. He's a guy who can get you about 18 points, three rebounds, and three assists, and then give up about 24 points, (laughs) five assists, and five rebounds. And I'm talking about Zach Levine in his four years and $78 million that the Kings were generous enough to try and take him off our hands. And the Bulls are like, no, we need to suck, so we're going to take you instead. The worst thing about this is is they didn't even take the two days to think about it. They took about two minutes. Yeah, He came, slapped the contract on the desk, and Gar Foreman ran trying to find a pencil to – to write, you race towards Sacramento and put Chicago back into it. Uh, well, you don't even have to erase anything. You just sign, and then you're uh, good to go. Uh, but, yeah, it was, it was a little frustrating, to say the least. Um, but what are you going to do uh, other than say, you people are awful. You people are have no clue how to run an NBA franchise. So, So for comparison... A player who's essentially the same age, who plays the exact same position, and who was also – it was actually an unrestricted free agent this year after being an unrestricted free agent last year was Contavious Caldwell-Pulp. Got, what, $15 million last year, $12 million this year. His net rating was negative one. Okay. Zach Levine's never had a net rating minus of lower than negative 3.2. Mm. So why would you pay exponentially more for a player who's exponentially worse? See, there, there. People bought into the athleticism from the dunk contest and thought eventually this has to translate to the real NBA, and it just has it because you keep hearing, you you hear from a ton of the fans I've been arguing with on Twitter this this weekend. Well, he's working hard and he's going to improve. He's not a hard worker on the court. Okay, he's a ball stopper out of the ISO mode of Carmelo Anthony that doesn't fit in the modern NBA. He's a guy who has no desire to play defense. Like. Defense is not a skill. 
you either physically have the attributes to play it or you don't. He's a good athlete with good size for his position. So he has the physical attributes. In the immortal words of of I'm drawing a blank on what Jesus Shuttlesworth dad was and of what Denzel's oh. name was. Anyways, in, in the immortal words of Denzel Washington was playing Mr. Shuttlesworth, it's not the skill of the man, it's the will of the man. And Zach Levine does not have the will to fucking play defense. Well, none, none whatsoever. So he's never going to be a positive player. You can't give up more than you score. And even even his positive offense is very streaky. He, you know, He's going to be a guy who scores 30 or 40 and then follows it up with 12, 12, 12. He's not a consistent guy. He's not a lead player. He's a sixth. His ceiling in the NBA is as a sixth man. That is his fucking ceiling, and they gave him fucking twenty million dollars a year. I can't reiterate this enough. They fucking suck at their jobs. They are fucking embarrassment to Chicago Bulls fans everywhere, and every fucking fan. And I put that in air quotes. Could go fuck themselves if they think this is a fucking good move. Get the fuck out of here with that shit. And I should have said it with a New York accent because that's how fucking angry I am about it. I, I'm, I'm perplexed. I'm angered. And I want to find a new team. I, I'd latch onto the Sixers, but I can't. They're past that cycle now. As much as I enjoyed watching their process and understanding that rebuilding can't be done in a year or two. It has to be a five-year process. You have to acquire superstar talents. And if I hear... Another goddamn article from a Bulls blogger about Wendell Carter's fucking Summer League 16-9 and nine performance with five blocks. Like, oh my god, he's the one guy in Summer League who decided to play fucking defense? Congratulations, you blocked five shots by standing at the rim. You, gr- you scored 16 points when Kevin Knox scored 22. And you're supposed to be the better player, and he plays the more premium position. I have one, one little twist on what you said. It doesn't have to take five years. The Pacers rebuilt in less than five years well, because they made a trade that actually benefited the Pacers. Well, and they also looked, I mean, some of that's luck. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, some of it was uh, taking a high, uh, uh, a more calculated risk. You know, they didn't take back a centerpiece who was coming off an ACL tear. They took a guy who's got all the skills to be a, be a number one and just never had that opportunity, whether it was in Orlando or in in Oklahoma City uh, and Oladipo. But the one key with him is you always saw his defensive effort. Again, defense plays everywhere in the NBA, and it's the one factor that if you see a guy playing defense, even when he's not a lead r- r- player or when he's you know not scoring well or not efficient offense, that's the guy you say – He's going to put in the work to get better offensively. The guy who all he does is go into the gym and shoot shots, but never works, you know, never tries on defense, is going to be Jalen Rose for the rest of his career. He's going, to, he's going to be a guy that's entertaining to watch sometimes. He's going to be a guy that more often than not, you're just scratching your head at why do we employ him? And he's never going to play winning basketball in the NBA. That's, that's just the reality of anybody like that. Andrew Wiggins is that other example. So, you know, as much as I would have rather had Andrew Wiggins than Zach Levine in the, in the Jimmy Butler trade, luckily we're not paying him five years and $150 million like Minnesota. But the same rules apply. If you're more focused on developing your offense, I don't care how hard you work on it. Effort on defense tells me who you're going to be in the NBA more, more likely than not. You, you may never develop an offensive game, and that happens to Andre Robertson or uh, Avery, who got, what, two years, $25 million? W- w- would you rather have Avery at 225 or, or Zach Levine at 478? Tell me which one's an actual better deal. And if I have to hear, well, that deal will take up less of the salary percentage of the salary cap as the salary cap rises. There's A, there's no guarantee the salary cap continues to go up five, six million. And they're predicting that, but they also thought the cap would be higher than 102 by this year, three years ago. So saying, well, we know where the cap's going is not an absolute. All it takes is, a small recession in the economy, which we're headed for like 10 years of economic growth is about the ceiling before we slow down, at least in some regards, which will mean less merchandise sales, which will mean less ticket sales, which will mean a smaller salary cap. And 20 million is a fifth of that cap right now. And it's going to still stay relatively close to a fifth. That's one of your five starters. He's not, he's not that guy. 
He's not a winning basketball player, and you've locked yourself in for four years, which means realistically, by the time you start to get to a winning place, hopefully, well, and, and by the time you get to the next rebuild for the Bulls at the pace they're going, you're going to have to offer him another contract that's even more prohibitive if he does t- pan out okay. You know, it doesn't even have to be great, but if he turns out okay, now you've kind of locked yourself in at 27 to giving him another contract. The next rebuild will not be led by. Paxton and for, or for me. You've met the Ryan Star family. It is very distinctly possible it could happen. No, he, he even gets to a point where he gets tired. I could just turn turn and look at the White Sox. No, he, no. He gets to a point where he gets tired. He just promoted Kenny Williams up. Well, he'll just, so, prom- he'll just promote him to where they have no job, real t- power. Well, but, That's what Kenny Williams is. I mean, that, that's true, but he also cares more about baseball than basketball. He always has. He's always paid more attention. He always cared more about baseball than the basketball. He's always cared more about the White Sox. Always his his preferred team. I, I understand it, but if they turn the corner there, then he can turn his attention to the Bulls because he's not going to keep tossing money down the drain to Zach Levine. But he's not losing money. That's the thing, the, because then they do things like, "Hey, we're going to just salary dump Jaron Grant and not get anything tangible back." Like again, you're going to tell me I don't care that he's probably not going to fetch you a first round pick anymore, even though he was one. You're telling me you couldn't have gotten a second-round pick out of the Orlando Magic as opposed to a player that you just have to flat-out wave so you can save $2.7 million when you're struggling to hit the fucking salary floor? Like, there was no need to trade Jaron Grant other than to try and, again, justify the trade that, that sent Taj Gibson and Doug McDermott to Oklahoma City for Cameron Payne. Oh, and we included a second-round pick in that deal, too, because this front office still has no clue of the value of a second-round pick in the modern NBA in taking a shot at a high upside player and being able to lock them into a very friendly three-year deal that's only partially guaranteed. So if they don't pan out, bye, but we're going to take the big swing, put you on the roster, and if worst case, you do pan out, at year three, we have your bird rights and restrictive free agency, and we get to sign you. Like, they don't, they don't get it. That's why, again, so you trade him for nothing. For a player that you already are going to waive. They've already waived him. Well, well, they said they have. I mean, you still got to wait for paper. Oh, okay. for I mean, everything has to be done in a, a certain order, but they're going to waive him, yes. You know, so, so you just dumped him so you could try and make Cameron Payne look better than Cameron Payne. Like, his ceiling is a backup point guard. Tops for Cameron Payne. Chris Dunn's ceiling is as a defensive specialist. But, again, I at least have more hope for Chris Dunn being an average NBA player than I do for Zach Levine. Because, again, the effort on defense translates to, to improving offense eventually. If all you ever focus on is improving your offense, you'd never get better at defense because defense is effort. I agree. I mean, I've been, just been sitting here listening to you because I knew you wanted to get this off your chest. So the Zach Levine slash Jaren Grant uh, complaint. So. I mean, I get, there there were plenty of teams who would have coughed up a second round pick for Jaron Grant. What was his salary? I mean, what, what was two point six, two point seven million. So again, we're not talking about a guy who's making a ton of money. It's not prohibiting you from signing other free agents. It doesn't suddenly make you more flexible. It's just typical cheap bulls being typical cheap bulls and car packs having zero clue how the modern NBA works. Again, they just don't they, – they view second-round picks as, as expendable when everybody else is trying to collect them and say, these are actually more valuable than late first-round picks. Hmm. Again, I know that they, they – like Chandler Hutchinson, who basically did nothing in the summer league game yesterday, absolutely almost nothing. Great start when you're playing in a no-defense exhibition, essentially, to put up almost nothing. Uh, but – so they they traded back the Pelicans their second round pick to get that first late first round pick. It's like you'd almost been better asking for trading Miritich for a couple seconds over a late first because of the flexibility that comes with that. You don't get locked into essentially the first three years of the contract like you do with a first round pick. It, it's it's mind boggling that they don't understand how the salary cap works. It's mind boggling that they don't have not figured out how restricting free agency works. Whether that's you know with a guy guy like Omar Sheik who they wanted to keep five years ago and lost because he got a three year ridiculously loaded twenty five million dollar contract where they would have had to pay a ridiculous you know cap hit one year and 
And then with Zach Levine, they, they overpaid. It's like, well, they were offered a four year 17. Four year 17 was too much. There's one of the, the bull sports writers said four years, 60 million sounds about right. And I agree. I think that's the most you pay for, for a sixth guy. You know, again, most teams would pay four years, 60 million for Lou Williams to be their sixth man too. I have no problem with, with Zach Levine at that number. It's a little high for my taste. And again, this all gets compounded by the fact that you gave Feliciano four years, 36 million last year before anybody made an offer. So they kind of talked themselves out of bidding against themselves, but then they talked themselves into matching Strictly for the same reason that they traded Jaron Grant. They're trying to make bad trades look better. They're trying to prove that they know how to negotiate a trade process. And they're not really good at it. Just admit the mistake, move on, and fix it. But now you well, double down. Well, that's the problem. Is Don't even look at it as a mistake. Don't have to admit it. Just say, this was a transaction here that happened here in a vacuum. And now this is a totally separate thing. Okay. Zach Levine, is he worth $20 million here? Fuck no. All right. Hey, Sacramento, you can pay him $20 million a year where you already have Bojan, Bo, 18 million vowels in a row, Big Donovich, and Buddy Heald at the two as well. So you're kind of duplicating yourself. Uh, knock yourself out. Uh, pay for the dunk contest highlights. Pay for a guy who's never going to be an all star. You know, it's all right. He's just, he's behind the eight ball, he's not worth the money. And it's why this rebuild is going to fail miserably. It, the, the, the pace they're on right now, they're aiming to be a 6, 7, or 8 seed again. They're not aiming for the ceiling that they set for themselves. No, and there's no way for them to get there. I don't, I don't mean I just don't see it. And not unless they, they're, they're going to be bad this year, assuming they do the right thing. And the problem is they're not doing the right thing in training Brook Lopez now. I mean, he's the one who needs to go sooner than later. First off, that's. 12 million bucks off the books. And two, he's somebody who actually plays winning basketball. So you might want to get him off the roster, you know, before you, you misevaluate him like you misevaluated Nico Miritich and you misunderstood, you know, misevaluated Draymond Green because you drafted for filling position instead of taking the best talent. Just fire car packs. Please, if there is anybody who listens to this that knows anybody in the Reinsdorf family or just knows how to hack the Reinsdorf family computer and put this this message on Michael Reinsdorf's computer on Constant Ripley, please fire Gar Foreman and John Paxson. Please fire Gar Foreman and John Paxson. Please fire Gar Foreman and John Paxson. I don't even want world peace. I just want Gar Pax fired. It's not a big ask. As a side note, we do not support the hacking lifestyle. You might not. I don't give a shit. Whatever. <laughs> give us fire guard packs on, on Michael Reinsdorf's mind. Somebody wants to go ahead and uh, hypnotize them into firing guard packs. I encourage that. Uh, anything short of like kidnapping and murder. I draw the line there. But anyway, short of there. At least you have a line. I'm okay with. So. I don't want to belabor that too much. I think we're already close to 20 minutes in on top of the last four episodes, three episodes that have been basketball centric. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily have anything over the top plan to talk about your Chicago Cubs. It's been reported. They have made an offer for Manny Machado. The first off that's reported. Second off, they don't have anything to offer. Third off, if it gets Addison Russell off my roster, I'm okay with it. Uh, fourth off, if it has it has to include at least one more big leaguer. And fifth off, I'd much rather we focus on getting a starting pitcher because uh, you know if I have to watch Tyler Chatwood pitch in the starting rotation anymore, I might go ahead and just run through a plate glass window because that would be less painful. Ah. Uh. I agree with Tyler Chatwood. I think Montgomery needs to stay into the rotation until he starts having issues. You mean like his last three starts kind of issues? Where he hasn't pitched well in his last three starts? He's given up, what, seven runs, six runs, and five runs? He gave up three runs at last time. Yeah, and they pulled him super early because of it. Because they knew Five innings. Oh, my God. Well, you're getting getting only five innings out of your $120 million man when he pitches. You Darvish. You Darvish is hurt. Let's wait till he gets back. I have full faith in you Darvish coming back around. I have 
no track record of Mike Montgomery being excellent. And with Kyle Hendricks' mechanics lost right now, we need somebody who could be better than okay at their ceiling. And that's Mike Montgomery right now. He's okay. Yeah, he, I mean, you need a healthy U Darvish. You need John Lester to keep being John Lester. You need to find a different pitching coach to work with Kyle Hendricks because the new one is not working with Kyle Hendricks at all. Fire Hinky. Quintana is pitching much better. So that at least he's turned around from his early season struggles. But again, if there's a guy like J.A. Happ you can get and then put Montgomery back in to help solidify your bullpen with Chatwood, I'm okay with that. Syndergaard. We ain't got the assets to get Noah Syndergaard. <laughs> oh, okay. Now you sound like every Yankees fan right now. <laughs> Give me Noah Syndergaard. Like, it's not going to happen. Like, the only way the Yankees are getting Noah Syndergaard is if they trade Glaive or Torres. Very sore subject for me, by the way. <laughs> but they're not going to do. Um, <laughs> the Cubs don't have anybody like that. They're not going to trade for – I don't see the, the, the Mets being in the market for Addison Russell. They already have a good young shortstop. Two, Addison Russell can't hit for fucking power again. Like all of a sudden, you know, he had one tiny hot stretch of power for like half of a season. Everybody's like, he's going to break out and be a power. Like, no, he's not. He's, he's a punch and Judy hitter. Well, you know what it would take. It would take your starting left fielder. It's going to take, I think it would take that and more. I, I think they're going to want something that's more controlled than three more years of Schwarber. Well, there's not much left of Syndergaard, is there? Uh, I'm going to point this out. I don't As know. I've been trying to point out to Team Epstein since the day they started drafting, fucking position players always in the first round and constantly over drafting, you know, drafting too many position players. Pitching's more valuable no matter how long the control is. It's at least two years of Syndergaard. Okay. I just don't but, know what, I didn't know what Syndergaard's years were. I don't either off the top of my head. But, but again, pitching's more valuable. Always and forever in baseball. 50% of starting pitchers were drafted in the first round of the draft. There is no other position where it's even close to that. Like starting pitchers don't come from fines late in the draft. You don't don't get bargains on them. Just doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Not going to be one position player. On the other hand, I would have much trade much rather have traded my current left fielder for th- two and a half years of Andrew Miller than Glaber Torres, who we traded for half of a fucking season of a Roldis Chapman. Which he still's not acting like a Rose Chapman. Uh, he's been pitching better lately, but and, and Torres is hurt right now. I see. But, I got hurt again. On the, but again, that's Torres. He's unlucky. I, he's just unlucky. He'd also be still in Triple A for the Cubs. To well, I'm just talking about his health. I mean, he's just unlucky. Yeah. He's like every time he seems to start getting there or trying to get there or he's starting to have success, he's getting hurt. Yeah, I mean, I think I think he's still fine. I think he I, like last year when he got hurt, that was. He wasn't getting called up last year anyways, so I think he was okay there. This year, obviously, he got called up and just went on a home run hitting tear. And I think being in Yankee Stadium helps a little bit there, but, I mean, he also just has that bat. I think I think there's going to come a point where two or three years from now when him, you know, Eloy's up in Chicago and T- Torres is still in New York and they're just tearing the cover off of all some of these trades that that – that Epstein has made are going to age badly. You know, Solaire's hitting better, but that was a trade you had to make. Yeah. First off, you just started to have too many outfielders, which we still kind of have. At some point, you have to make a decision with, with your group of Hap, Schwarber, Almora. You know, Hayward's not going anywhere for at least another year and a half and probably staying the whole eight years. I'm, I'm not sure his agent will talk him into opting out. Even if he did opt out after year four, he's still like, like 28 or 29. Yeah. Like he is still relatively young, which would be kind of, I mean, like the, the plus side of that deal is like he's 33, 34 at the end of it. He, you see, you're not buying bad years, but at some point you're going to have to trade, you know, a combination of possibly two of these guys, young guys in the outfield for an arm, you know, there's one, there's, there's, Actually, two, three, three people I say is untouchable. You're, I will say, yeah, there's three. I, I, I'll, I'll say there's three. I'm saying, let me go first, and then you can follow me through. Your I, catcher, I, my second baseman who plays every goddamn position in the world. Yeah, 
I, I knew I knew I wasn't going to argue with the third baseman. Can you trade him for? But he's going to be hard to trade to get equal value. I mean, you granted, fan, you he's not power. Hit, he's not power hitting to where anybody anticipated him because he worked so hard to cut down his strikeouts. Well, in the process, he also it, it, it's the trade off you make if you're that kind of power hitter. Right. You know, it's it's strikeouts and home runs, or not strikeouts and not home runs. Where you know, so that's why I don't mind when Javi Baez strikes out. They've been walking some lately, which is perplexing. But especially, he's been walking more ever since he made the comment. Is I I, I take a walk as a fail at bat. <laughs> I'm okay with that strategy. Well, I, I am too. But he's been walking more since. Then. I think teams have just like all right, we're gonna see how ridiculous you'll get with your strike zone, and he's like, not that ridiculous. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're like, oh, well, we're gonna try it again, anyways. Javi Baez has gone to the Vladimir Guerrero of there's not a bad ball to swing at school. When he hits him the way he hits him, I mean, not necessarily wrong. Like the home run he hit yesterday to deep right center or left center. That was just – it was a slider on the outer half that just got a little too much of the plate, which typically you would want to take the other way because it's, you know, a slider away. Hey, like, now watch this. I can pull this. No problem. <laughs> Boom. Fuck. <laughs> okay. Javi. Javi. <laughs> and then he just does what he does. You know. Oh, hey. I'm going to just drill a ball right at the pitcher off his glove to bring in the tying run. And then, hey, with one out and second base open, I'm going to try and steal second base just to stay out of this double. Oh, fuck. The Cubs won. <laughs> like, at, at some point. You don't forget. He wasn't done yet because he didn't steal. Th- he stole third, too, before they uh. got the third out. I was say I didn't even worry about that, but it, it's it's one of those things that like there's a saber metric argument to be made for a lot of things in baseball, and it's the pro the argu- as much as I love stats and I love advanced stats because they tell you a lot more. Too many people fall in love with on base percentage and, and and OPS particularly on base plus slugging, and, and fail to understand that they're both pretty flawed numbers for two separate reasons. And then there's just the stuff you can't account for with with a guy like Javi Baez. Like, you know, Sabermetrics tells you that stealing is a bad strategy or, the you know. But when you can be as successful as somebody like him is and, and just the hidden stuff that you can't statistically account for. Like, there is no statistical method to account for taking off on a pitch and staying out of a double play. Like, but that to me is more valuable and clearly was because it resulted in a win – than drawing an extra walk. When he, when Cantana, Cantana pitches, Baez is playing Little League Baseball because depending on what person's up, he can be at second base, shortstop, or third, and they're switching per batter. They're not even they're not even saying, Tavi, you're going to play this inning, you're going to be at third base. No, they're switching per batter now. Well, in, in, exactly. It, in not only that, like... His position right now with Bryant Hurt strictly depends on who's pitching and the lineup they're putting out there. So like they're like today they put Ian Happ at third base because they knew more balls would go to second with John Lester pitching, and they wanted somebody who could tag better when he's stealing bases because they obviously know more people steal. So he's literally become so valuable in ways that that even advanced metrics can't cover, and they are going to have to create a Gold Glove. Uh, category for him because it's just preposterous that there's he he is likely again to not get a gold glove because they will view him as not having played a position enough to win at any position and it's like but he's the best defender in the game by I don't far care what position you put him at like I get that in most teams you would put that guy at shortstop, but to lock him in at shortstop is just not value it reduces his value they're going to hit the ball at second base. Javi. Just, Javi. Javi. We're going to third today, Javi. And, and it's just one of those things, too. Like, you, you run into this thing where you, you want to call him the most exciting player in baseball. And people question that. And it's like, how? Like, do you want to miss his at-bats? Mm-hmm. I don't. Do you want to miss him playing defense? Mm-hmm. I don't. Do you want to miss him on the base path? I don't. You never know when he's going to decide to steal home again. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> hey, hey, pitcher, I'm stealing home on the next pitch. Yeah, he's not stealing home. Oh, Son fuck. Of, like, nothing against the Bryce Harpers of the world or the Mike Trouts. They're just not as entertaining all the way around. Uh, they may be more entertaining in small doses, but A, they're both more polished hitters in the more modern sense of I'm going to have a four four oh five on base percentage. Whereas Javi Bias is at three thirty with a five sixty slugging. Like he's slugging higher than Chris Bryant's highest career slugging right now. Like that's what he's doing. Cause again, it's not just the home runs. It's all the doubles and the triples. <laughs> like there was a stretch where he didn't have a single for like two weeks. <laughs> like every hit was a multi, you know, well, uh, extra you, base you, hit. You missed the important part too. It's the infield singles too. It's like, yeah, oh, we got him. He, oh crap! <laughs> He's standing on first. I still got the ball. Like, why, why do you run that hard? Like, that, this is what we would like to call in the business a routine ground out. <laughs> but he ran hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's his name? Clint Hurl? You can shove it up your ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Old guys go away. You're not needed. <laughs> now, and just beyond that is... I had something and I lost it. <laughs> I'm not sure where you were going there. I had something I was thinking of and I, I absolutely lost it. I don't know. But... Uh, your Cubs are – the Brewers lose yet this week? Uh, they lost yesterday. I think they won today. They beat Braves like 8-1, I think it was. Yeah, they're still in first, but it's by what, a game? game, yeah. A game, and we pretty much has lost every one of our most important people for a part of time outside of Javi Baez pretty much. Oh, game and a half. Game and a half. But it, then, then we haven't lost our most important person. <laughs> That's the reality of it. <laughs> oh, so there's a lot of people who have always questioned Joe Madden when he, you know, and I think to be fair, I think the front office has questioned Joe Madden when he has said Javi Baez is my one irreplaceable player because <laughs> he just doesn't fit the mold of what this front office wants no. to do. They want that 360, that 380, that 400 on base, and they they want that guy. And Javi Baez is just, a, but Joe Madden's like. I know you're a, you're a math nerd and and you know math and you see the saber better. What he does, I've been put in baseball for 50 fucking years, and people don't do this. <laughs> like, understand that. This is not normal. You can't buy this. <laughs> well, technically, the Cubs did buy this. But but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, there's nothing that you can uh, trade for. Fucking Cubs, I hate them. What they do now? They're sending Chris Bryant to Tennessee for his rehab start. Yeah, I seen that earlier yeah, today. I'm talking cocksuckers. Just oh, just because he lives in South Bend and he wants to go see the game. Exactly, I would have went to go see a Chris Bryant rehab star. I'm kind of, like, more importantly, that's the whole purpose it, purpose of having a single A affiliate here. Like going to Double A is not going to tell you he's more prepared or not. He's going to overwhelm any pitching he sees at the level. But the advantage of sending him to single A is he's an hour and a half away. I guess are they on the road this week? It could be. I don't know. As I say, I'd have to look at because the only advantage you would have is if he's closer for travel purposes. But yeah, well, they're in San Francisco the next three. That doesn't even. No, that's garbage. Yeah, he should have been here in South Bend. That's you know the White Sox for years sent all their best players here because of, South Bend's not in town either. Yeah, I, I didn't look at that. I don't know, but. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, possible, but still, I don't like that decision. Rehab him at single A. Let him come down, drill some home runs, and go. Even if he's out of town, even if they're in Fort Wayne or mm -hmm. Grand Rapids, put him in the single A club and just one day or two days in here. All right, back up you go. You know, just get a couple swings and, oh, you're healthy? Great. Mm -hmm. I think that cops out our, our Cubs talk because yeah. it's just over 30 minutes now. Uh, I I know I got one topic that I know you have an opinion on. Wait a minute, is there a topic in this world I don't have an opinion on? I mean, I, I obviously have have created a platform multiple times now for me to talk about stuff into the world, and and people from world over have listened to me talk. Mm -hmm. well, Clearly, first off, people value my opinion, and second off, again, I rephrase the question or re re ask the question: Is there anything in this world I don't have an opinion on? 
Okay, you have an opinion that we haven't touched on very much. Okay, that that's a better way to phrase it because saying I have an opinion on something is like saying air has oxygen and we need water to live. Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, ten million dollars. I'm taking Tiger Woods all day of the week. <laughs> there is no first off, physically that he seems to be fine, and his game has always been better than Phil's, particularly with the putter and the short game. Uh, so the, the fact that his drives wayward doesn't bother me. And two, there is nobody in in the history of golf who's been mentally tougher than Tiger Woods. So you put ten million dollars on, like particularly if it's their own ten million dollars. It, it's supposed to be. It, it, <laughs> I'm taking Tiger Woods every day of the week. First off, because he's not sweating ten million dollars the way Phil Mickelson is. He's like, Pfft. I, I give this give this to uh, the girls from Hooter or no, his ex wife. Oh. Ingrid or I don't know. Yeah, I got to her this big of a check every year for child support. Like, <laughs> pfft, shoot, T- Nike will cover this just on the apparel I sell <laughs> for um, this year. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely a Tiger Woods. I always love these ridiculous golf exhibitions because it's it's one of the games where it's played so differently, but yet it's fun when they do these one off exhibitions that that are just like true one on ones, you know. Match play. The only thing, it's the ten million dollars. I mean, that's how, that's a chunk of change there for the. I know it's not a chunk of change for them, but it's a chunk of change just for ten million dollars. I was gonna say, here, I'm gonna look it up real quick, just for fun. Let's see what Phil Mickelson's net worth is. <laughs> Three seventy five. Okay. So, so he, you know, again, he'd miss it, and Tiger was. After post divorce is worth seven forty, so again neither of these guys are sweating ten million. In all fairness, I mean you're still gonna sweat writing that check no matter who you are. <laughs> like son of a bitch. <laughs> I guess the question is: Is it five million a piece, ten million total to the winner, or is it a ten million skins game where you know? I don't know. You, That'd be, they haven't worked out the details yet, but it's supposed to be ten. Winner gets ten. And it's all because Phil had to talk some trash before a golf tournament where he missed the cut and Tiger made the cut, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I, well, I thought it was just something simple as Phil said he prefer, he wants to play with Tiger and Tiger said I want to play with Phil and we can never seem to get there because one of us is up and one's down. And they said, oh, yeah, watch this. No, no, they paired him for opening two rounds of some tournament. Oh, okay. And, and Tiger, Phil was talking some trash because when they played in tournaments, most often Phil's shots lower scores than Tiger mm. And he's like, so we asked Tiger, hey, would you ever want to play on one on one for some money? I'm like, he's like, for a number that's make him uncomfortable, I will. <laughs> <laughs> what number make him you uncomfortable? <laughs> um, ten million dollars. Yeah, Good, fun. I'm in. <laughs> it's like, because you can't go for a number that makes Tiger uncomfortable because that could be everything that Phil has. It's like, I'm not playing for that high of a number. So no, I, I I always I always enjoy those. They've done. It's been a while since they've done one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tiger did one a while ago where they played under the lights, part the last certain number of the holes, and it was actually part of the exhibition where they brought lights out, okay. and, and it was a, a, a match play challenge for something. Or I can't remember who it was with, but they it's been done before. Golf sets itself up for that. Now uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I almost forgot. And we were just going to wander into nonsense. Uh, and this is nonsense. Uh, you know, shout out to Daniel Cormier for, for, for knocking out Stipe Miocic. Uh, I didn't see it. I didn't pay for the pay-per-view. And I didn't even bother to to get on a pirated stream last night because uh, my internet has been acting up. Uh, mainly because I have a really old modem router combination and it sucked. And I was trying to upgrade that today in Comcast. You could suck my dick because your customer service is awful. And I'm trying to get it set up today. Uh, and, and I've been on it for five hours. Again, Comcast is terrible. Uh, and this is what happens when we let cable companies have create their own monopolies and don't have competition for customers uh, because, quite frankly, I can't get good internet anywhere else around here. Uh, so I'm stuck with them. But anyways, you know, he did knock, him out, knock Stipe out in the first round. There is some questions raised about multiple eye pokes, so I'll have to, to watch some recap of it later and see what, what was talked about. But can we stop all this, the GOAT talk? Uh, I know he's the fifth person to win multiple UFC championships and, you know, championships and divisions. But the only reason he's the lightweight champion is because John Jones keeps getting popped for, for drug use, whether that's recreational or 
quote unquote performance enhancing. Like clearly, John Jones is a better fighter than Daniel Cormier at any weight class, at any time, any day of the week. Just he is better. So you can't be the go when you can't when there's somebody who's constantly in your way. You know, if you want to say George St. Pierre, because he's never had that one guy. If you want to say Anderson Silva, because he never had that one guy, great. Uh, although Anderson Silva was never a two weight class champion. But we saw guys like BJ Penn, who didn't, you know, was a two weight class champion. Nobody's confusing him for the go. He was a great fighter, but at the end of his career, like his last fight, Nate, Nick Diaz, sorry, beat the living shit out of him for five rounds, even though he didn't want to fight him because they were friends in tr- at one point. You know, uh, so I'm trying to think. Conor McGregor, who has the Nate Diaz monkey on his back because he's 0-2 against Nate Diaz. I don't care what those god-awful judges say. You know, the UFC wanted him to win. He, he was able to get to a decision, and, and they gifted it to him so they could have a trilogy. Uh, I covered BJ Penn, George St. Pierre, Daniel Cormier. Oh, and Randy Couture. Randy Couture and George St. Pierre are the two that have a claim to a shot of the goat out of out of that you know out of being the two weight class champions cuz the other three all have have you know BJ Penn again just took a lot of beatings at the end of his career and the, the other two have somebody that's standing between them and their ultimate greatness it's really you can't have somebody who just owns you and then claim to be the greatest yeah you know, nobody owned Michael Jordan nobody owned you know Bill Russell you know, nobody owned Joe Montana or, you know, True. there just weren't these situations going on. You know, baseball has never had it. Like, there's just no GOAT discussion in baseball because it's such a different sport. <laughs> and it, it, it really, the same rules that apply to baseball should apply to football because of the two sides of the ball and, you know, all the moving pieces and players and different, you know. I've always thought that, that the concept of a football GOAT was ridiculous. Like, you just have to look at the best at a position. And then, again, you have to look at it by errors because, as I said, in basketball, it's hard to judge errors. It's even harder in football when they've, you know, safetyed up the sport, I'll call it. Yeah. Uh, but, again, shout out to Cormier. You know, I'm, I didn't get to see the, the Francis Nagano, Derek Luce fight I wanted to. And I'm glad I didn't from all indications. It was three rounds of dancing around. <laughs> uh, Nagano apparently is – being very tentative after his loss to Stipe, and he was his very conservative again. And then Derek Lewis was in between rounds complaining about a back injury that everybody knows he has acting up, and he still toughed it out to win the fight. But you know, he's now he's setting him up for a fight against uh, Stipe next, realistically. And then you had uh, the whole WWE fake garbage that this is the biggest reason why I hate that. that Cormier won because I guarantee you Stipe Miocic wouldn't have had no part of that WWE type antics of <laughs> oh, I'm calling out Brock Lesnar cut down to the cage I'm a fix of you and da, da. No, it was awful it was terrible like UFC should be ashamed that they have to do this Brock Lesnar has made a lot of money being oh. bad at that well but it's different I you expect that in the WWE. I'm talking about in UFC, he's made a lot of money by acting like, a, like that persona he has in WWE in the UFC. But, but my point is, th- no, this is different. This time, you could clearly tell the UFC encouraged it because they would have never let him in the cage otherwise. And two, Daniel Cormier was in on the on the act. Like th- This was all staged. If Cormier won, this was always in the plans. So it, it, it's not just that he was acting like a hill or... Or, you know, you get Conor McGregor who talks a ton of trash. You get the Diaz brothers who always talk trash. But that's just because they actually mean it. They aren't doing it to make money. <laughs> There's a difference. Uh, but this time, the, you know, the UFC was in on it to try and drive pay-per-view buys. Because they just haven't – they don't want to pay the guys who can, who can actually sell pay-per-views. And then they just keep wondering why their numbers are low. Like, not this one, but 225 sold maybe a quarter of a million buys. And and they get this problem that all sports have, like racing's having the same kind of identity crisis, and 
there was a boom time in in the late nineties, early two thousands for for kind of all sports, where there where there was a casual sports fan who watched a lot of fringe sports. Then now they're just like, yeah, we kind of tuned in, and now nah, we'll just stick to the main ones. No. We're we're good. Like there is no casual NASCAR fans anymore, and they're not coming back. There's nothing you can do to bring back a casual fan. You know, you, you've tried different cars, you've tried different race formats, you've tried different championship form. They're not coming back, and all you've done in the meantime is alienate your hardcore fan who's like, I, I don't recognize this anymore. And the UFC is having that same identity crisis now. They sold for four point two billion dollars. You know, the the agency that bought them is like, great. Now we'll, we'll make a ton of money. We'll track. You know, we'll help keep attracting these casual sports. Like. Combat sports has never had a casual sports fan. <laughs> Either you love to watch two people beat the shit out of each other, or you don't. There is no like, well, maybe I'll tune in. Other than like, really just huge events, and th- and there's nobody in the UFC stratosphere that crosses over like that yet. Like McGregor was the closest, and that's just because Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather's like, fuck it, I can make three hundred million dollars beating on you for nine, ten rounds. I'll do that. Sure. <laughs> But even then, he's not going to sell. You know, he might get him to a million pay per view buys, which would be a great number for the UFC. They've only had that happen a few times. But, you know, the May- Mayweather McGregor did three, four million. Most most Mayweather fights do three to four million. Like, so it's funny when people try to to write the eulogy of boxing, and they you know talk about how MMA is up and coming, and it's you know, not really. Combat sports have always been about the big stars. Like, there is no casual fan. There, you know, yeah, boxing used to have enough fans that they had, you know, smaller fights did tr- generate more interest than they do now. But, again, the, we're just talking about the death of the casual sports fan in French sports. And I'm not even sure there's very many casual fans who tune in for NFL or NBA anymore. Like, there's a reason why TV ratings are pretty consistently gaugeable. You know what's going to change that? The gambling, the gambling will increase watching because if you've got money on it, it's a lot more interesting. I don't know if it'll increase it that much. I think it'll help some, but I I think a lot of the people who are going to gamble on sports legally were already gambling on sports illegally or at least in fantasy leagues that, oh, that well, had money. I live in Indiana. It's not the easiest thing in the world in Indiana to find a bet. You haven't tried. <laughs> it's not that hard. Okay. I said Trust me, it would would not have been hard to find a place to place a bet in South Bend or in Indiana in general if you wanted to place a bet. But again, you're not a casual sports fan either because here's the thing. Most people aren't going to bet on sports that don't know a whole lot about sports. They would when they'd go to Vegas just because like, oh, I'm in Vegas and this is something different. When it's in every state and you can do it everywhere, it's not going to be different anymore. Right. So you're going to have this situation where it's like, okay, we'll do it this way and it'll be okay. Your, your people who were betting with boogies, the boogies will be the ones that will be the most bad. <laughs> the, the last remnants of the mob have to be thinking, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> They're putting us out of business. Jesus Christ. It's bad enough when you had the offshore online stuff. Now you're going to let real casinos take these majors? Shit. So, yeah, I don't see that being a big impact. At all. I was thinking of a basketball game where you get the button. Is Carmelo Anthony going to shoot on this possession? I yes. Think, I think we're a long way away from that. I think, first off, the way most laws are going to be written is you're still going to have to be in a, in a casino okay. of some sort to bet. You know, I think this. I think there may come a day where where prop bets get to be there, but I think most states will be very. Hesitant to do that other for, than for major events like the Super Bowl, okay, something like that. Just because, essentially, if you start, you know, there may you may allow halftime bets where somebody can kind of hedge their bet. Like, say, you placed a thousand dollars on, you know, the Pacers to beat the Bulls on a day, and then the Bulls get out to a thirty point lead. Well, maybe you can bet three thousand. At halftime on the Bulls, so that way if they win, because you know the odds will, will adjust to to offset the thousand you're going to lose. You know that may be about as far as most states go. Because I think if they get into that thing where they allow almost instantaneous betting on like 
possessions. Like you're just encouraging addictive gambling. <laughs> like again, a, a, a casual fan, a person who doesn't watch a sport is not going to sit there and say, Hey, I think Carmelo Anthony's going to shoot a three here. It's going to be somebody who has a problem. <laughs> Somebody by who's way, trying to make up for money they've already lost. By the way, that's Jason. He'd bet on two kids throwing rocks on the parking lot to see who bet through the rock the farthest if he had a chance. I would. I, I own that. <laughs> I love betting on anything. It's okay. I don't have a problem, though. I, I, I can draw a line on it, but I would just bet on about anything. Yeah. Uh, but I don't even know how we got here. You were talking about casual sports fans, and what ah, I brought. The, I believe that will bring more people. To I don't. I don't think it will. I, I, I think a we're just all busier now. B there are more options for entertainment than there's ever been, so you just don't have to watch something that you're not that interested in. Again, between YouTube and Facebook Live and Instagram TV, whatever the fuck that bullshit is, they're trying to push down my throat every time I log into the app. There's just gonna. A, we're creating, we're essentially creating double the content every day that you, you know we used to. So there's just infinite amount of con, not infinite, but almost infinite amount of content to choose from. People aren't going to choose selectively, you know. Like, eh, well, it's on TV. I guess I'll watch. It. Like, it, it's over for sports in that regard. What you have to do is is work to shore up your base. You have to make sure you don't alienate your fans. And the NFL is struggling with that big time now. I think the NBA will overtake it because of that. Because, I mean, obviously you're still adding fans in general because there's more people. I think football is going to struggle to add fans. I think baseball is trying to cope with struggling to add fans. Soccer is still just not relevant in the United States. I had a buddy who went to the Indianapolis 11 pro game yesterday for them. It was empty as shit there. <laughs> Like he posted pictures, it's like looked like a WNBA game there. <laughs> well, how do they get some of the big European people to come here and pay them, them bigger contracts? Then, uh, a it's markets like LA and New York where they do DC care. And Seattle, I think, would afford that. Yeah, kind of did that. And it's also not as big of contracts as you think they are. That are tied. A lot of those contracts are tied to ticket sales and okay. TV ratings and merchandise sales. They're essentially cutting them in as almost a part owner per se without making them a part owner and they're all guys from europe that at the end of their run oh yeah I know, man. so they're I know not going to get paid by europe anymore so it's less than they were making any you know right it, it's an attempt to to make soccer relevant. and it's just not uh you know hockey's gonna have its hockey bait fan base and, mm-hmm. and like yeah. i said it, it's, it's right now it's a two horse race between the nba and the nfl and the nfl is struggling because they just mismanage everything like there's not one thing in the last ten years you'd look at and say, yeah, they kind of did that right. <laughs> there's one way to quickly fix the NFL: had hand over the reins to Adam Silver and let him fix it. Because damn it, whatever he everything he does in the NBA seems to be working for them. Well, let's let him finish fixing the NBA first, and then we'll get back to the, to, to then he can go run the NFL. <laughs> or actually, I'd rather him run the N- M- MLB next and fix that, but. You know, and again, you get all these people like, well, they need to change the collective bargaining agreement of basketball because the, uh, you know, teams like the Golden State being able to build super teams are ruining the NBA. No, they're not. It's when you have a team hand four years and $78 million to Zach Levine that's ruining the NBA. Bad front offices are ruining the league. Like, the Golden State Warriors were smart front office. They got a couple, I mean, they got a couple lucky breaks. Again, if they don't get Steph Curry to jump at that four-year, $45 million extension when he's coming off an ankle injury and wants to lock in finances, then they could never have the money to add Kevin Durant anyways. Right. So it was a fortuitous luck. Them, them and everybody else in the league passing on Draymond Green once, them three times before they drafted him, you know, was more fortuitous luck than foresight. You know, everybody's like, well, like all they did is draft well. And man, you know, get a couple of lucky breaks with the cap to be able to add Kevin Durant. It's not like they've went out and hired a bunch of mercenary free agents. <laughs> this isn't the Miami Heat, you know, the Heatles, right. where it was Dwayne Wade and a bunch of outsiders. But 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 their other eight people came from free agency. Yeah, they signed Swaggy P. Oh, that's a great great great. <laughs> Anybody that's in the world could have signed Swaggy P. Jaja Pujulia. 
So yeah. sign, sign another minimum deal this year with Detroit. Congratulations. David uh, West. Ooh. Ring chasing. And, yeah, Ooh. it was very ineffective. And, no, they had Jordan Bell that they bought from the Bulls. And uh, Sean McCaw. And they had a couple other guys that were internal. But they also took the chance on, uh, what's the point guard? Their backup point guard. Livingston. Oh. And I- I- Iguodala was a free agent. And he, and he was an all-star caliber guy or at the end of his all-star caliber years when they signed him. I need to rewind this about Livingston. I have to let everybody know, you were a Sean Livingston fan before Sean Livingston was even a Sean Livingston fan. That's true. But, I mean, again, they took a chance on him after he shattered his kneecap. It's not like they got him at peak Sean Livingston hey. value either. They got him coming off a catastrophic injury, took a chance, and it paid off. You know, the but you see, you know... The Celtics, it took some fortuitous luck with the Nets making a dumb trade and then doubling, deciding right after, you know, basically one year after the trade, well, we're not going to spend a bunch of money, so we're just going to be bad even though we don't have our picks, which made no damn sense. Like, at least throw money out there and try and be competitive when you don't own your draft picks. So they got lucky there, but then they used those picks wisely to take chances. They're like, this is a gift from God. Let's take our swings here. We're going to swing for the fences. The Philadelphia 76ers are like, we're going to be bad, but we're going to be so bad that we can add superstars. We're not just going to try it. And now they're trying to change the lottery. And it's like, you're not disincentivizing teams from being bad. You're just, well, now the top three teams all have a more evened out chance of having the first pick. So you just ask more teams to be bad. Or, you know, again, you're not necessarily having to be as bad. Like, I get you don't want people to be where the Sixers or the Hornets were a few years ago where they were almost, N- you know, NBA, re- you know, historic bad. But you're still racing to the bottom three. Right. Even though they're not great, they're still better than finishing eighth or ninth. Chances of getting the first overall pick. So how many NBA teams should there be with the current talent amounts? I like 30. 30? Okay. I do. I mean, I'd love to see Seattle have a team again. But I think there are... <laughs> You know. Well, I was going to propose this the uh, European soccer module. If you want to be bad, hey, fuck you. You're getting demoted and somebody else can come up and play basketball. I love relegation. Unfortunately, because of the way the, the modern sports are set up in, in the United States, they're not set up for that. Like, relegation was always part of, of, of football over in Europe. Which, by the way, English, the English called it soccer until we started calling it soccer. And then they had to be dickheads and call it football. Like, it's soccer. It, well, no, that, like I said, they called it soccer too. Yes. Like we didn't start calling it soccer by coincidence. We didn't like we have to be different. It was like no, you guys called it soccer too, and now you're trying to be different because we, fuck fuck the rest of the world. <laughs> soccer is just popular because people are poor and don't have any other choice. Okay, I just have a, you sound a little Trump Trumpish there. Fuck the rest of the world. Uh, on soccer, I say <laughs> fuck the rest of the world. Not on everything, just on soccer. Like I, I get tired of that. I mean, it's the world's most popular sport. Yeah, because people are poor and they can play soccer when you're poor. It takes two trash cans and a wad of paper. Like, congratulations, it doesn't make it the most best sport. Most popular does not equate to best. It just equates to the most popular. Jersey Shore was at one point the most popular show on TV. Nobody equates that with the best show on TV, do they? No. But there's a lot of people making a whole lot of money in Europe playing soccer. And a lot of people who made money fucking making Jersey Shore too. Again. Most doesn't make it best. There sure. is n- there is no correlation or causation there. <laughs> don't make the weak arguments. But I don't even remember where I started with this. I couldn't tell you. I can't remember this one either. Relegation. Oh yeah, the NBA. Not going to happen because it's not. There's too much money lost. So that's the thing that keeps the soccer teams investing. You. You get a when you go to a B league, you get smaller TV revenues and you get smaller ticket shares and less tickets, so you lose revenue because of the way the that American sports have always been set up, they're not set up with that model in mind. So it's hard to say an owner who paid two million two billion dollars for his team, hey, you're relegated now. You're not going to get all of this TV revenue money. So it would, it would just shake to the foundation of sports, but. Are there markets that probably don't have teams that shouldn't? Probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, who am I to say which ones they are? I don't know. 
but I always felt dirty that that uh, Oklahoma City got a team. And I'm, I mean, they seemed to do a great job supporting him, but so did Seattle. And the one like they didn't. I guess I, I don't know who I would move to Seattle. So, I mean, I guess to get Seattle a team, you'd have to go to 32 because can't. I mean, don't get me wrong. The NBA has done odd numbers before, and it works because of the way they schedule. Right. But it would just be odd. Plus, I guess if you're going to have 16 teams in the playoffs, it's nice to have 16 miss. <laughs> but I can't think of where else I would add a team besides Seattle. <laughs> like... Mm, yeah, every conceivable place. That- Las Vegas. I'm not opposed to that. I always love the idea of Las Vegas having sports. I mean, <laughs> they they should- got hockey. They're going to have football. Just, uh, I, I mean, again, but talent wise, I think 30 is fine. I think I think that was the key argument there. Is, is, is yeah, or the key yes is talent wise. It's thirty the right number. Yeah. You you really killed my argument because that's where I was going the regulation, and then you fucking say thirty, and they have thirty teams. So it kind of killed where I was planning on going. I mean, I, I've made the argument that relegation would be great for American sports. I, I mean, and in theory, if you were going to do relegation, you already have the D League. Yeah. What you could just do is move the cities of the D League, where you know the Bulls and the Windy City Bulls aren't both in Chicago and Rosemont, neighboring towns. Right. You know, and then, but the problem is, then they're not minor league feeder teams like they are now. Which I like that model. I again, I think that needs to go a long way to fixing the one and done rolling college. I've, I've advocated for it before, and I think they need to allow it in the NBA. It is follow the baseball rule. You can come in at eighteen, or if you're going to college, you're going for three years. We're gonna we're gonna add a third round to the draft, and and to, to make that palatable to the players' union. You would have to do maybe one year guaranteed NBA contracts for second rounders and for third rounders, two year G League guaranteed contracts or, or something similar to that, where you at least make it palatable to adding the extra round and taking away those undrafted free agents. You know, because again, as an undrafted free agent, you can always market yourself to the team where you probably fit best or choose where you live, things like that. Mm-hmm. So you're taking that away the, from guys who are technically aren't their members, but again, a, Adam Silver is tired of the one and done rule. So, you know, luckily he's the anti David Stern in that. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't seem to have that problem. But I think there's a good way to say, look, if, if some of you guys want to come out at 18 because you're just not college people, but you're not ready, we're going to have this third round where, where maybe, hey, you get taken in the third round and you're not guaranteed an NBA deal per se, but we're going to guarantee you two league, two years in the G League to develop. You know, be attached to a franchise and and blend kind of the existing structure along with kind of the European model of developing your own own people. I think I think a minor league in basketball would be entertaining. I think though to, to protect the value for the teams, you, you would also have to make it so the guys that they draft and, and put in the G League as developmental players can't be signed by other teams to NBA contracts, which I think the union would have a problem with. So you, you there, there's a lot to be worked out on that theory. Right. Or maybe what you do is if you draft a guy in the third round, you get two years guaranteed G League, and then when they turn 20, anybody in the NBA can sign them. If, if after two years you've decided you don't have a spot on your roster for them or they're not ready, then they're, they're, they're basically – you could stay in your G League team if nobody else interested. Is, is interested in them on, a, on an NBA level. Oh, but they can't just pilfer them, pillage them as a G leaguer unless you renounce your rights. Right. You know, just create something where you you solve the one and done problem, but also don't have a ton of eighteen year olds flooding in and then becoming Cook. I can't think of his first name. Kid was the number one player in the country when with LeBron and Melo that went undrafted because he had to sit out a year. His senior year because he had weird moving things and no, I don't remember that name. I do. There's a really great documentary about him on uh, Netflix about the whole not getting drafted and then bouncing around, you know, G League in Europe and then just injuries and in lack of discipline ruining his, you know, taking away his, the rest of his shot. But you know, so you you want to have a softer landing for guys like that who who. You know, go through the draft process 
And and again, maybe he didn't get drafted, which I I never understood why somebody didn't at least take a second round flyer on him. But you know, offer a third round where then you can say we're gonna put you here for two years, work with you, develop you with you know and, you know NBA quality coaching, and then either you're good enough and we'll bring you up, or you know you're free agent, maybe somebody else wants you, or you can stay in the G League or go over to Europe or. I think there's a lot of ways to fix that. That that would be more interesting than because again, relegation is just not going to happen in American sports. I love the idea, I really do. You know, again, not only from the standpoint of preventing teams from from necessarily caught. You know, because you get into the whole Brian Colangelo issue with the Sixers, where essentially got placed there because the other owners were tired of losing money because the Sixers were so uncompetitive that people wouldn't come watch, and they were. You know, it was actually hurting the salary cap because they weren't drawing at the gate. Uh, So, you know, I understand wanting to protect that. But, again, no owner is going to sign up for now losing their share of, you know, top prime, you know, top level revenue sharing or trying to add in four four or six more teams to make relegation workable. Because, again, you'd have to add – you can't just have two – I mean, I guess you could just do two relegation spots – but that would be kind of weird. Then if you only had two teams go down and and then compete in the G League, then you're having to add too many. You know, again, you couldn't just add two. You'd have to add like six or eight because you couldn't necessarily take the place of the G League. You'd have to create almost another league. Or I don't know. Again, the, the leagues are too far formed for relegation, whereas relegation was always part of the European model. And I think there's just more interest in – football over there where even you know almost every city has a club that that people will go out and support whereas you put a team in the nba you know you put a grand rapids team in basketball if they're not in the nba nobody's tuning in you know grand rapids isn't going there in droves to support it right. so i i think that's always, always a difference as well as we've always supported the major league sports minor league doesn't get the same level of support Well, I think that really kills the episode. We're at about an hour and five. Uh, I was really hoping to get to something besides sports, but didn't. That's, you know, okay, too. There, there are other, time, you know, other things. Like I said, the, the whole whole premise of this podcast, and, and, and as my description says, it's, you know, it's my place to talk about sports, news, politics, pop culture from – from the perspective of myself, a middle-aged man, and Todd, a slightly older middle-aged man, when he joins me. Bullshit. Uh, you know, so that's the whole concept. I know sports has been been kind of the focus lately, but it's also just that time of the year where you had the NBA draft and NBA free agency and, you know, gar packs, just doing gar packs things where they deserve to be fired and just not having any sense. Uh, but trust me, there are episodes coming at some point that won't be completely sports focused. <laughs> A, because we're getting that time of the year where it's going to be baseball and baseball only. And then you're just going to have the, the worst sports day of the year, which is the day after the All-Star game when there's just no sports. So much so that ESPN created the ESPYs and has just now made those ridiculous to cover that space. So like I said, don't worry. Other topics are coming. Uh, but please subscribe, rate, review. Uh, share it with your friends. Share it with your neighbors. Uh Again, you can find us on Facebook at the Don't Worry Nobody's Listening podcast page. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and YouTube, uh, J-A-S-O-N-B-A-N-I-C-K-I. Uh, you know, you can argue with me about this stuff all, all day long. If you get on my Twitter timeline from the last weekend, you, you, you should be arguing Bulls and UFC on there just as much as I can until I just get tired of arguing with people who, who, who don't want to see, 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 the, see, the, see the light. See that Zach Levine is a bum. See that Daniel Cormier isn't the GOAT. Like, some things are opinions in this world. Some things are facts. It is a fact Zach Levine is a bum. It is a fact that Daniel Cormier cannot be the GOAT in in, in the UFC. These are the things. Uh, But we will talk at you again hopefully next week. Uh, I'll be in Bloomington packing up the rest of my stuff to move back here. Uh, So it may be a pre-recorded episode that I just release on next Sunday. Uh, So that could be a wild card of anything. Uh, but we'll talk to you later. You can oh, go. I was going to say, 
It's going to be whatever pisses him off in the next six days or anything that severely pisses him off and he picks up a mic within the next six days. I mean, that's usually what it is. Although some of this stuff didn't piss me off. It was just interesting conversation and me thinking out loud. Yeah, but we spent another 30 minutes on Gar Foreman. No, we, we spent got- about 15, 20 minutes on Gar Packs. And again, they deserve to be fired. Anyways, uh, subscribe, rate, review. This, this will help make it easier for more people to find us. Again, iTunes, Google Play Music, uh, CastBox, Satchel, P- Podbean. I keep trying to say Peapod, which is the grocery delivery service. Uh, and talk to you guys next week. Because I cannot change. I will not evolve. That's all we got. One goddamn hit. You can't say goddamn on the air. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway.